Would you take out your message notes inside your program? Today we're in part four of a program uh, our series on how God meets your deepest needs through a church that's built on purpose. God has five purposes for your life, and he designed his church to fulfill those five purposes in your life, to help you fulfill those purposes. And today we're gonna look at worship and how worship, with, particularly worshiping with other people, changes and transforms you. You know, I was thinking today that one of the many realities of life that atheists have to come up with an explanation for is why do human beings naturally desire to worship? I mean, we're hardwired for worship. If you don't worship God, you're gonna worship something. But the amazing thing is, all around the world, in every single culture, people worship God in different ways, in different styles, in, in, and not even in the same belief systems. But we're hardwired for worship. Now, that certainly isn't something, uh, a, a factor of evolution, because it's not necessary for survival. So why is it that people automatically uh, have a desire to know God, to know something greater than themselves? You know, in, in the world, there are about 600 million Buddhists in the world. 600 million. There are about 800 million Hindus in the world. There are about 1.4 billion Muslims in the world. There are about 15 million Jews in the world. Of course, so many were killed in the Holocaust and that shrank the, the, the propagation of the Jewish faith. But there are 2.2 billion Christians in the world who say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. It's the largest organization on planet Earth, far bigger than China or India or China and India put together. The actual number of people who are atheists is really quite small. And if you've ever gone to a rock concert and you've seen people, you know, you know, shaking their phone, uh, what, that's about as close to worship as they're gonna get. So today I want us to look at why you, we wanna worship. We're gonna look at three or four basic questions about worship, what it does in our lives, and let's just begin first with a definition. What is worship? Well, I wrote one there on your outline. You might look at it. It says, you might write this down. Worship is expressing our love and gratitude to God. Worship is expressing our love and our gratitude to God for who he is, what he's done, what he said, and what he's promised to do. Now, that's a mouthful. Let me read it again. Worship is expressing our love and gratitude to God for who he is. We adore him, that's adoration. For what he's done, that's gratitude or, or great, uh, thanksgiving, for what he said in his word and what he's promised to do. And so anytime you express your love to God, you're worshiping. A lot of people think worship is music. Worship tool, uh, worship tool is music, but worship is much, much more than just music. We're gonna look at that uh, in today's message. Now in Mark chapter 12, verse 29 and 30, Jesus says this. The most important command of all is this one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. One day Jesus is asked, what's the most important command in the Bible? He says, here it is, love God. With all your heart and mind and soul and strength. Love God emotionally, love God physically, love God practically, love God with every area of your life, mentally. Now, I wanna ask the question, why do we express our love to God? Well, there are four big reasons. I could give you 25, but let's just give you four this weekend. Four reasons why we express our love to God in worship. Number one, because we were made to be loved by God. We were made to be loved by God. And because we were made to be loved by God, we inevitably love him back. First John 4, 19 says, we love because God first loved us. If you don't feel like worshiping, it just means this. You don't realize how much God loves you. If you understood how much God loves you, you couldn't help but love him back. Our worship is a response. Our love to God is because he loves us. The only reason there's any love in the universe is because God is a God of love. God is love. And so he made us as objects of love. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 says this. 
in the New Living Translation. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. See that verse? Before God created the universe, he had already chosen us in mind. He, he wanted you, so he created the universe so you could exist. And he chose us to be in Christ, to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan, it has never changed, has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. Why do we worship God? Because we love him. And why do we love God? Because he loves us. We were created to have a love relationship, a friendship with God. Number two, we worship because everything comes from God. You look around, the air I breathe, the air you breathe, your heartbeat, your body, the water you drink, the food you eat, everything, the sunshine, everything comes from God. Not only did God create you, he created everything in the world to sustain you. First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 14, David says, as he has collected the largest offering ever in history, it was actually over, I think, uh, uh, in today's terms, about uh, $300 million in a single offering, and it was for the building of the temple in Jerusalem. And David says this in 1 Chronicles 29, 14. These gifts did not really come from me and my people. He's saying this to God. Everything comes from you. And we can only give back to you. We can only give you back what you have given us. So why do we worship? Why do we express our love to God? Because he loves us. We were made to be loved. And number two, because everything comes from God. Number three. We worship because we understand life through worship. We understand life through worship. Every time you focus on God, you come into his presence, you drown out everything else, and you center in and focus on God in worship. It raises your perspective. It broadens your understanding. All of a sudden, things start making sense. Have you ever been in a service where you walked into a worship service and you thought, I have so many problems and I'm going under and I, I feel like I'm ready to throw in the towel and I, I'm, I'm ready to give up? And yet something was said as the pastor taught from God's word that all of a sudden you thought, that makes sense. I get it. Now I know what the problem is. I know what the solution is. In Psalm 73, verses 16 and 17, David said, I tried to understand it all problems that were in his life. But he said, it was just too hard for me to see. I just couldn't see it until, notice, until I went into the temple of God. He says, then I understood what was happening. All of a sudden, he gets God's perspective. He gets God's wisdom. You get God's wisdom when you worship. You get it from the word. You get it from his presence. Then you understand what's going to happen. How many times have you gone, oh, wow, now I get it. You're not going to get that kind of perspective watching television. You're not going to get that kind of perspective playing a sport. It only comes when you're in contact with God. And when I'm in contact with God, I understand life through worship. If you don't go to worship, you're going to miss out on the perspective that God has in store for you. Now, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I can worship God out in nature. Well, of course you can worship God out in nature. Who made nature? God did. People say, I feel close to God in nature. Of course you do. He made nature. And when he made man, he put him in a garden, not in a skyscraper. Man did that. But here's the point. You can worship God in nature, but you can't fellowship by yourself, and you can't involve, involve other people in the act of worship. Personal worship is a good thing, but so is corporate worship or group worship. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. And if you only have personal worship, you don't have group worship, you're missing out on the larger perspective that comes when you come to God's house of worship. David says, when I went to the temple, then I understood what was going wrong in my life. And you might not get that anywhere else. Now, there's a fourth reason why we worship together. And it's because God strengthens us through worship. 
God strengthens us. He not only helps us understand things clear, we get a, a bigger perspective, we get a clearer conviction on life, but we also get the energy and the power to do it, where? Through worship. There's so many passages I could share with you about how worship is designed to strengthen you, that when you focus on God, and when you love and express your gratitude to God, he strengthens your heart. He strengthens your soul. He strengthens your body. Psalm 18, 28 to 32. I love this, the contemporary English version. He says this, you Lord, keep my lamp burning. What does that mean? You keep my lamp burning. You know, if a lamp is, is built on oil, pretty soon it's gonna run out of oil, just like a car can run out of gas. Have you ever run out of emotional gas in the middle of the week? You got to get refilled. You got to get recharged. How do you do that? By going to worship. And he says, Lord, when I come and I worship you, you keep my lamp burning. You, you keep me bright. You keep me sharp. You keep me on fire. You keep me lit up. He said, you turn darkness to light. You're going to miss that if you're not in corporate worship. He says, you help me defeat the enemies of my life. Did you know that when you come to worship, God gives you strength to defeat the things that would defeat you? in life, all of those little uh, things that irritate you, that pick at you, that gnaw and nip at your heels. He says, you defeat the enemies of my life. Your way, Lord, is perfect, and your word is correct. So he shows the right way, and he tells us the right thing to do. He says, you are a shield for those who run to you for help. He says, you give me protection. And then he says this, you give me strength, and you guide me right. Bam, that's what happens in worship. I get spiritual strength and I get spiritual instruction. I get the right way to go and then I get the energy to do it. I get strength and guidance on, the, on hand. Now, what kind of worship does God love? What kind of worship makes God smile? Because the Bible says real clearly, there's a right way to worship and there's a wrong way to worship God. You certainly don't wanna worship God in the wrong way. How do I worship God in the right way? Well, in two words, write this down. Here's the kind of worship God loves. Wholehearted worship. God loves wholehearted worship. It's the opposite of half-hearted worship or insincere worship. He loves passionate worship. He loves it when you tell God that you love him, you tell him passionately. When you're grateful for what he's done in your life, you tell him and thank him passionately. When you praise him, you praise him passionately with your whole heart. Did you know that when you do worship with your whole heart, that God blesses you in ways that he, you wouldn't normally be blessed? Second Chronicles chapter 31, look at this verse. Second Chronicles 31, verse 21, love this God's word paraphrase. Hezekiah dedicated his life to serving God. That's what the Bible says. Everything he did in worship, in God's temple, see this is corporate worship. Everything he did in worship in God's temple, he did wholeheartedly. And now notice this phrase. Oh, by the way, as a result, it says, he was very successful and he prospered. Hezekiah had one of those successful and prosperous reigns as a leader of Israel. And why did God prosper him? Why did God give Hezekiah such amazing success? Because he worshiped God wholeheartedly. You know, God hates the exact opposite of wholehearted uh, worship. He hates insincere worship. He hates heartless worship, fake worship, Worship with your mouth, but not with your heart and your mind and your soul. You gotta love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Let me give you an example of the kind of worship God says, you might as well just forget it and don't even check in. Isaiah 29, verse 13, God says this. These people say they are mine. Now, let me stop there. God is saying, these people claim to be my children. They claim to be in my family. They claim to be my followers. They're believers, he says, these people say they are mine, but they honor me only with their lips. Their hearts are far away from me. See, that's, that's heartless worship. He said, they're not worshiping me with their heart, they're worshiping me with their lips. It's just lip service. And he says, their worship of me 
amounts to nothing more than human traditions that they have memorized and they say by rote. Oh my, have you ever been in a service like that where everything was memorized and said by rote and nobody's actually feeling it or saying it? They're saying it because they memorized your tradition and they go to worship week after week and they say the same prayers over and over and over and they say the same rituals and the same liturgy over and over and over. And he says they've memorized it and they say it by rote because they're not even thinking about it. Their mouth is in gear, but their mind and their heart are not engaged. God says, don't even, don't even bother. I don't want that kind of worship. I don't want memorized worship, memorized worship by rote. That's just from the mouth, but not from the heart. What kind of worship does God want? Jesus tells us in John chapter four, verse 23. He says, true worshipers, circle that, true worshipers. You wanna be a real worshiper. You wanna be an authentic worshiper. You want to be the kind of worshiper that Hezekiah was that God could bless with success. Jesus says true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That's the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Now, what does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? Well, first, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about, that's a small s, that's your spirit. He says, you need this, when you worship God, it needs to be authentic and it needs to be accurate. It, authentic in spirit and in truth, accurate. It needs to be uh, doctrinal and it needs to be devotional. It needs to be real and it needs to be passionate. Pa in truth, it's gotta be authentic based on God's word and in spirit, it's gotta be from the heart. It's gotta be heartfelt worship. Now, I wanna say something to you right now that may shock you, but I know that because we now have podcasts and we now have services online. There are many, many thousands of people watching this service online right now. Well, that's better than nothing, okay? It's better than nothing. But I want you to write this down and then I wanna explain what the antidote is to it. Write this down, this is very important. Watching worship is not worship. Watching worship, watching other people worship is not worship. You see, God says, I want you to come to the house of worship. I want you to come to my temple. I want you to gather together. I want you to do the 58 one another's of the Bible together. Watching worship from your iPhone or your iPad or from television or from the internet, that's better than nothing, but it's not worship. Why? Well, in the first place, you probably multitasking. Uh, a lot of times you'll turn on a podcast and you're washing dishes or you're working in the garage or you're studying or you're you know picking up clothes or vacuuming, you might be ironing or whatever, and you're multitasking. Worship demands your total focus. And so it's real easy to check in and out. Well, click, I'll, I'll watch worship for 15 minutes, click out. That wasn't worship. You watched a worship service, but you didn't worship because you didn't enter in with other people in the prayers and in the giving and in the silence and in the confession and in the committing and in all the other elements of worship. So when you're sick, obviously, tune into a worship service. When you're on the road and you can't be in your local church, do that. But you need a regular place of worship. And if you're in a place where there is no church, some of you are in foreign countries where there's no church in your village and you're watching this, start a group, start a house church, start a small group. The Bible says where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. All over the world, the people gather in small groups. I know a group in Singapore has 60, 70 people that meet in a house and they don't just watch the Saddleback service, they worship together you can start a, a house church. You can start it uh, in a building, in a home, in, a, in an apartment somewhere, and actually where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I'm in the midst of them. So stop watching worship and thinking you're worshiping. You know, actually getting up, getting dressed, you know, getting clean, washing your hair, brushing your teeth, putting on some clothes, and going, going to a place of worship. That is an actual act of worship too. 
The Bible says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. How long has it been since you've been in a house of the Lord? You say, well, I, you know, I, I go once a month or once every five or six weeks. God wants you to worship him on the first day of every week. So worship, watching worship is not worship. Now, how do I worship? I, I wanna give you some, some tips here. Um, I, I wanna talk about how do you tell God that you love him? And I wanna give you seven different very practical acts of worship. So write these down. But not only are we just gonna write them down, we're going to do them. And in each of these, uh, we're going to pause and usually ask you to actually do what I just talked about. Now, the one that we're starting with is what we're doing right now. The first way you can worship, write this down, is by listening and responding to God's word. By listening and responding to God's word. I'm teaching you from God's word. What you're doing right now is an act of worship. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 31, verse 12, in the New Century Version, it says, gather all the people together, men, women, children, and the immigrants living in your towns. He's talking about visitors, people who, who are not citizens here. Gather all the people together, men, women, children, and immigrants living in your towns so that everyone can listen and learn. So to respect the Lord and carefully obey everything in his word. Notice he says, this is something we do together. We worship together. We're to gather together. We're to get up and go to a place of worship. Are you doing that every week? That's what God wants you to do. Psalm 85 verse eight says this, I listen carefully to what God, my Lord, is saying, for he speaks peace to his people and his faithful ones. Now, notice he says, I listen carefully to what God says. How do you listen carefully? Well, one of the ways you do is what you're doing right now, take notes. The, the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. And one of the reasons why we pass out notes at Saddleback and, and let people uh, see the notes that they can take notes on is so you can listen carefully. Did you know that you forget about 95% of everything you hear within about 72 hours? That's the United States Air Force statistic. And uh, that's a depressing statistic if you're a pastor. It means that well, I could spend all week preparing to teach you, and then by Wednesday, you've forgotten 95% of it. You could have been a member of Saddleback Church for 30 years, and you've forgotten 95%. You've forgotten all but 5% of everything I've ever taught, unless you wrote it down. But if you write it down, you can go back and review it. When we teach the Purpose Driven Church Conference to pastors, and over a half a million pastors have taken this from 164 countries, I give them 15 reasons that they should never teach without actually handing out an outline. In the first place, everybody uses different translations. And so when you look on an outline, everybody can read from the same translation. In the second place, writing it down increases your memory and your retention. Third, you can go later, go back and, and review it. I won't go into all of these reasons. I know guys who've you know, wadded up the sermon notes and put them in their wallet and pulled them out later when they need it. You can put it up on the wall. You can underline, you can circle, you can take notes. So all of these are just to help you to listen carefully to what God says, for he speaks peace to his people. But it's not enough to just take notes. If you're really gonna worship, you have to do what he says. The Bible talks about being doers of the word, not hearers only. In John 13, verse 17, Jesus says this, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if, notice, you do them. He doesn't say you'll be blessed if you know them. He doesn't even say you'll be blessed if you take notes on them. He says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. So taking notes, is a part of worship, why? Because it helps me to have my to-do list after worship is over, all right? So the first way that you can express your love to God is by actually listening carefully to the word of God and you care enough to take notes. I'll never forget that one time I read the verse where Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine. 
And as I was reading that verse, I, I felt the Holy Spirit saying, Rick, who do you think the swine is? And I said, well, that's gotta be the religious Pharisees who you know, were attacking Jesus all the time. He said, no, you're the swine. I said, what, what, me, why? He said, because you don't care enough to write down what I say to you. And, and, and the, the word of God are the pearls of wisdom that come out of the word of God. And God is casting these pearls at you, but you're just letting them fall away. You're not writing them down, you're not connecting them, you're not collecting them, you're not reviewing them, you're not applying them, you're not practicing them. So I'm casting pearls before swine. So learn to listen carefully. That's an act of worship. Take notes and, and write yourself to-do lists of things you're gonna do as a result of what you learn from the Word of God, all right? Let's go to a second way to worship. This is one we all know about. I can worship God, I can show my love to God by singing to him, by singing to him. When we sing to him with our whole hearts, and it's not half-hearted singing, it's singing with our whole hearts. Remember, God loves wholehearted worship. Psalm 32, verse 11, I love this in the message. It says this, celebrate God. Sing together, everyone, all of you with honest hearts. All of you, raise the roof. <laughs> I love that, raise the roof. Worship is meant to be a celebration, not uh, a commiseration. It's meant to be a festival of joy, not a funeral of sadness. He says, sing together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Not I was mad or sad or bored or oh brother. It's not a duty, it's a delight. Celebrate God, sing together but it's really important for you to learn to celebrate with other people. I have a counselor friend, a, a therapist, who everyone who comes to him who's depressed, one of the first questions he asks is, did you sing all the songs last Sunday at church? And they said, no. Well, he says, impression without expression leads to depression. And, and you need, for your emotional health, you need to sing. You say, well, I can't carry a tune in a baggie. I, I, you know, I'm a prison singer. I'm always behind a few bars and I never have the right key. Well, you know what? The Bible says make a joyful noise. Anybody can do that. And so you don't have to be on key. You just have to sing with your heart. And you know what? Would you rather sing by yourself or would you rather sing with 100 people or 300 people or 1,000 people? The Bible says we sing together and that is an act of worship. You know what we're gonna do right now? Before we go to the next one, we're gonna stop and practice. So let's sing together right now. Would you stand with us? Let's sing together. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, yes. only you God. Let's sing this together again. You give life. Restore every heart that 
lift our voice in praise Cause you're worthy Yes, you're worthy Let's declare this this morning Let's sing this all to the Lord All the earth All the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry These bones will sing Great are you, Lord All the earth will shout your praise Don't you feel a whole lot better after singing with all your heart? Did you know that music and love go together? Because music is God's gift for expressing emotions. And all of the emotions that are known to man can be expressed through music. You know, there are radio stations that are dedicated entirely to just love songs because they are a way of expressing emotion. Now, I know some people come to church late because they go, I just want to hear the message. And they want to come in and the music, they don't worry about getting there. You are making a big mistake. And it is detrimental to your spiritual health, to your soul, to your spirit, and to your emotional health as well. You need to sing these songs. You're cheating yourself. You're missing out on an important amount, a moment of, of, of worship if you don't sing along the song. So learn to sing the songs. Praise is a mood lifter. It's an antidote, as I said, to depression. Now, let's go to a, a third way that we worship God. A third way we worship God is by talking to God together in prayer by talking God to God together in prayer. Now, of course, you could pray on your own anytime, but you know there's added power when we pray together. The Bible says when two or three agree as to anything, it shall be done. There's additional prayer power when we pray together. In Acts chapter one, verse 14, it says, they all join together constantly in prayer. You know, we would have the the power of the New Testament church, like they had in Acts. We'd see those kind of miracles if we prayed as much as they did in the book of Acts. Paul talks about the importance of prayer in corporate worship in Romans chapter one, verses 12. He says this, we must help each other with the faith we have, and your faith will help me, and my faith will help you. So when we pray together, and we're all praying for the same thing. That builds my faith, it builds your faith. You don't get that when you pray on your own. There's an additional element of prayer power that happens when you pray with other people. And that's why prayer together is a part of worship. Let's pause and pray as an act of worship. So right where you are in your seats, I'd like to voice a prayer over you as you pray silently in your minds and your heart for the people around you and for your own needs. Let's lift those up to God today. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you first and foremost. We praise you because of who you are. And we know that you're a great God and we also know that you're a God who loves us and cares deeply about us, your children. God, your word assures us that every hair on our head is numbered 
And if you care about the smallest detail of our lives like that, God, how much more are you interested and intimately aware of our needs, of the things that weigh us down, of the things that we feel like we might be lacking? God, you know and you care about what we care about. And we thank you that you're caring and a loving and a merciful God. In this moment, God, we bring to you our needs. We bring the needs of those around us. We place them at your feet, God, knowing that you are fully able and capable to meet our needs and knowing that you are faithful to meet our needs according to your glorious riches. So we thank you, God, that you are a good God and that you care for us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. All right, welcome back, and thank you for praying for each other. You know, one of the things I've learned about a relationship, uh, whether it's friendship or marriage, I've been married now over 42 years, is that if you're gonna build a relationship, you've gotta communicate. Uh, on the days that Kay and I communicate with each other through the day, our relationship grows. On the days that I don't get to talk to her through the day, uh, it, it decays. The same is true with God. If you want to build a friendship with God, you got to talk to him all the time. Of course, you can talk to him all the time, but if, if you never talk to your spouse or they never talk to you, you'd start doubting that they loved you. And if you really love God, you're going to talk to him all the time. What do you talk to God about? Well, whatever is interesting to you. You can talk to God about your hopes, about your dreams, about your fears, about your hurts. You can talk to God about the conflicts. You can talk about how your stomach feels. You can talk to him about things that you feel are not fair. There's nothing off limits in a love relationship with God. He wants to hear everything that is a concern to you. He doesn't want to hear what you think you ought to talk about. He wants to hear what's really concerning you. Prayer is not a duty, it is a privilege. And if you don't feel close to God, uh, there's a simple remedy. Talk to him more, okay? Talk to him more. Prayer is an act of worship. But particularly when we pray together, there's power in group prayer. And so pray in your small group and pray in your Bible studies and pray when you're at, at, at a church worship service together. All right, let's go to number four. A fourth way that we express our love to God is by sharing the Lord's Supper together. Jesus gave us two symbols of his death and his burial and his resurrection. One is the Lord's Supper and the other is baptism. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said, this cup, the, the cup of communion that he was gonna pass around to his disciples, he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. So do this often in remembrance of me. We are to do this often in remembrance of him. Jesus said, I want you to take the bread and the cup together because it symbolizes my death and resurrection and my salvation that I've paid for you. The fact is, Jesus paid the penalty for your sins by his death on the cross. And he broke the power of sin so you could be free from all, all of the habits. And he guarantees freedom eventually from the presence of sin in your life because of what he did on the cross. One day you're gonna be in heaven, there's gonna be no sin there. So what should be my attitude when I take communion? Jesus' sacrifice uh, did three things. It, 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 it paid for your forgiveness. Every sin you've ever done wrong is completely forgiven. It's wiped out, washed away. Think of the most guilty thing you've ever done, the thing you're most ashamed of uh, in your past. And in a minute, when you take communion, thank God that that's forgiven. It's not only forgiven, God wiped it out. It's forgiven and forgotten. So he paid for your forgiveness. So what should be my attitude when I come to the Lord's Supper, when we take communion in just a minute together? Should it be guilt over my sin? No, because it's all been paid for and forgiven. Should it be grief over Jesus' death? No, because he didn't stay dead. So it's not a grieving thing. He came back to life. That's what Easter's all about. It shouldn't be guilt and it shouldn't be grief. The attitude for the Lord's Supper is gratitude. 
I should take it grateful, grateful. Uh, Eucharisto, I receive it with thanks that God would love me this much. Now, communion is not for everybody. If you have never accepted God's gift of salvation and forgiveness, you shouldn't take communion because it doesn't mean anything to you. It, 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 it's, it's meaningless. It doesn't help you in any way. But if you have never given your life to Christ before we take these elements, you need to say, God, as I take these elements today, the bread and the juice, I am saying by taking these that I accept what you did for me and I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to accept me into your family, and I need your salvation. That's the right way to take communion because Jesus paid for your forgiveness. He also paid for your freedom. So I want you to think about the thing that you would like to change the most about you, what you'd like to change but you don't feel you can change. And, and, and in a minute, I want you to thank God that you have the power to change that he will give you because of what Jesus did for you. Your forgiveness, your freedom, and then your future. The Bible says, because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, that he has a future for you in heaven. The Bible says, eye has not seen and ear has never heard, and no one has even imagined the wonderful things God has prepared for those who love him. So, not out of grief, not out of guilt, but out of gratitude, we take these elements and we thank God for our forgiveness, we thank God for our freedom in Christ, and we thank God for our future in heaven. Number five is by recommitting our lives to God. Many of you did that as you were taking communion. communion. Some of you did it for the very first time and you committed your life to Jesus Christ saying, I want you to, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. I want to accept your salvation. I need your forgiveness. Now, this is an important act of worship. Romans 12, verse 1 says this, because of God's great mercy to you, in other words, because God's been so good to you, offer your lives as living sacrifices to him, dedicated to serving him in a holy and pleasing way. Now, I'm going to stop right here and look at this verse for just a minute. First, it says, because of God's great mercy. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve. He's merciful. Grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. So mercy takes away all the bad. Grace gives us all the good. He says, because of God's great mercy and his grace, he says, offer yourselves as living sacrifices to him. That means you say, God, I give you myself. You know the only problem with the living sacrifice? It can crawl off the altar. <laughs> and that's what happens. On Sunday, on the weekend, we say, God, I give you my life. I give you my time, my money, my life, my energy, my future, my reputation. And then on Monday, we crawl off the altar. We sing onward Christian soldiers on Sunday. And on Monday, we go AWOL, A-W-O-L, absent without leave. The Bible says, offer your lives as living sacrifices to him, dedicated to serving him. This is an act of worship. God, I wanna serve you this week. Serving him in a holy and pleasing way, this is your spiritual act of worship. Underline that, this is your spiritual act of worship. Did you know that every time you make a spiritual decision, a spiritual commitment, you are participating in worship? Nothing ever significant happens without worship you will become whatever you are committed to, whatever you commit to. And so your decisions determine your destiny and your commitments determine your character. And so worship is something that we say, God, I, I give you myself to the sixth act of worship. Write this down. I show my love to God by giving back some of what God has given me. I show my love to God by giving back some of what God has given me. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. When I first fell in love with Kay, I could not keep money in my pocket. It's like it was burning a hole. I wanted to spend it on her all the time. Why? I was in love with her, and I just wanted to buy her things. Because I, I, when you love somebody, you want to be generous with them. You want to give them give to them. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave. 
And, and so in giving uh, back to God, we don't give out of duty. We don't give out of, out of uh, uh, you know, pressure. In fact, you should never give out of pressure. You give out of love because if you don't give out of love and you don't give wholeheartedly, it doesn't matter. But giving is an act of worship. A lot of people think, well, when the offering baskets are passed, that means it's time to get out and leave because the worship is over. No, one of the most important parts of worship is the act of you giving back to God. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse two. In the Living Bible, it says this. On every Lord's day, each of you should put aside something from what you've earned during the week. What's the Lord's day? It's the first day of the week. And put aside something you've earned the past week and give it back to God as your offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you to earn. Now, this is pretty basic. It's proportional giving. If you made a lot of money this week, then you give a lot back to God. If you made a little this week, you give a little back to God. If you didn't make any, then I guess you don't give anything back to God. You can always give something. You can give a penny if you have to, but it's just an attitude that says, God, I want to express my love to you by giving. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you to earn. Now, the Bible uses the word tithe, which means 10%. It means if I earn $1,000, $100 comes back to God. If I earn 10 bucks, $1 comes back to God. And then I'm going to come back and close the message with the last uh, point. in my soul I hear the music ring And though the storms may come I am holding on To the rock I cling How can I keep from singing your praise Singing your 
All right, welcome back. Now, here's the last of seven ways. There are many, many more other ways that you can worship God. You can worship God in silence. But the seventh way that I wanna give you this weekend is that I show my love to God by being baptized to publicly declare our faith. We're baptized as an expression to the world. It's not in secret. It's kind of our coming out party. It's kind of your debutante. It's your, it's your saying, I'm not ashamed to say, I love Jesus Christ. And let me just close with a few verses. Romans chapter six, verse three, tells us that baptism symbolizes what Jesus Christ did for us. In the message paraphrase, it says this. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin behind where we, and when we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace. We left the old country of sin under the water. We come out to the new country of grace, a, a, a new life in a new land. That's what baptism in the life of Jesus means. When we're lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. And when we're raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. So it symbolizes what Jesus did for us, but it also has a much other, greater significance. Colossians chapter two, verse 12, tells, that, tells us that baptism symbolizes our dying to an old lifestyle. Colossians 2, 12, and the message says, going under the water was a burial of your old life, and coming up out of it was a resurrection. God raising you from the dead, just like he did Christ. So it symbolizes Jesus' death and resurrection. It symbolizes your dying to all your old sins and being a, given a brand new life. And then it symbolizes our new life in Christ. Galatians 3.27, and the message says this, your baptism in Christ was not just washing you uh, up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe. Have you been baptized as an adult when it's your commitment to Christ? Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. Are you ashamed to let other people know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? If you're not, you need to be baptized. I wanna challenge you to realize that baptism is an act of worship. And if you've taken communion, but you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. Now, what are all of these verses telling us? Well, let me give you a closing verse. Ephesians 2.22 says, in Christ's body, that's the family of God. That's the church. It's what we're talking about during this series. In Christ's body, you are being built together. That means you and everybody around you who's in the family. This family called Saddleback Church is just part of the expression of God's family. In Christ's body, you're being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. God doesn't live in buildings. He lives in people. You become part of the temple of God when you're part of a local church family. In Christ's body, you're built together to become the temple of God. What a great thought. I want you to think about this week.